Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief presentation. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction. Um, the talk is going to be there, and we are going to have a Q and A at the end. This talk is being recorded. If you have any questions, there's a Q&A tab on this platform. So if you could post questions there, that's a good place to aggregate them. If you happen to place them in the chat, I can also easily you know, transfer them over to um, Q&A, but it is easier if you post them in, in the Q&A tab. This webinar is being recorded. A little bit about me briefly. I'm a statistician data scientist. I'm a founder. Uh, I am the founder of Data Umbrella, and I am on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub as Reshma S. So feel free to follow me um, if you would like. We have a code of conduct. Uh, we're quite strict with our code of conduct because one of the reasons that this community was created is to provide a safe and inclusive environment for people from underrepresented groups. We take our code of conduct very seriously. In fact, at our last session, somebody posted something quite inappropriate in the chat and um, they're, you know, they're no longer um, part of the group. So please, um, please you know, really take this seriously. And you know, this may not be for everybody, but this is sort of the agreements that we have as a community um, to make it professional and inclusive and welcoming for people. We are also a volunteer-run organization. There are numerous ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost one is to follow our, our code of conduct and contribute to making it welcoming, collaborative, and professional. The second is we have a Discord community chat. It's on our website, so feel free to join there and ask and answer questions there. We have an open collective of, for Data Umbrella, so if you would like to donate to support us, uh, to pay our meetup dues and other expenses, that would be great. And we have uh, an initiative, an open source initiative for editing transcripts for these webinars um, to make them accessible. Uh, this is the GitHub URL for that. Um, and uh, feel free to check it out and email us and ask any questions. We have, we have a bunch of people that are working on um, transcripts as well. We have a job board as well, which is jobs at dataumbrella.org. So if you are in the market looking for a job, feel free to check it out. And also there's an option to subscribe to a weekly digest. Our website has a plethora of resources on accessibility, diversity, responsibility, allyship. Um, please check it out um, at your convenience. We also have a newsletter which goes out once a month. It's, uh, you can find it at dataumbrella.substack.com. We promise not to spam you. We only send the newsletter out once a month. So um, it's, a, it's a, another way to get information about our group. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. Meetup is the best place to find out about upcoming events. Our website has resources. We have Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you want to subscribe to YouTube, we record all of our webinars and um, post them on YouTube. So that's a good place to check out our previous webinars, this webinar, and upcoming ones. So in December, we have two events, contributing to NumPy and contributing to Pandas. They have not yet been posted on Meetup, but they will be soon. And the best way, as I said before, join our Meetup group to receive updates. Today's speaker is Thomas Fan, who is a core developer of Scikit-Learn. He is also a staff associate at the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. And Thomas maintains Scorch, which is a Scikit-Learn compatible neural network library that wraps around PyTorch. Um, I also want to say that, you know, Thomas is um, with the meetup group. Um, there's a New York Python meetup group. In fact, that's where Thomas introduced me and others to Streamlit. And I reached out and asked him, well, this is really great. Would you present for us? And he said yes. So thank you. Um, and with that, I will keep my fingers crossed and hope that Thomas can share his screen and um, get started. Thank All you. Right. I'm going to press this button and see what happens. Wow. All right. Hi, everyone. Could Rishima, could you see the slides? Yes, I can. I just turned off okay. the mic, but yes. OK, good. All right. Welcome, everyone. Today, I want to talk to you about Streamlets, using Streamlit for data science. Most of this is going to be um, a demo 
of many demos, and I'm going to showcase how one could use Streamlets to make dashboards. Um, so what is Streamlet? Um, Streamlet, the way I see Streamlet is that it's a, it makes it so that you could quickly create dashboards or applications while stayed in Python. So the workflow looks kind of something like this, where you have code on one side, and then you have something that auto um, updates when you save your code on the left. So this is how I'm going to showcase how this works in, in this talk. Um, so most of this talk is demo. So I'm going to pr provide three demos. Um, they get progressively more um, advanced. Um, the first one will be something uh, it will showcase the uh, Streamlet as a as a library and how it interacts with pack, um, plotting libraries, and then I'm gonna get into some data science. I'm gonna train a model on the data set that we looked at from the first demo, and then we're gonna train a model in Jupyter Notebook, or in, in my case, Jupyter Lab. And at the end, I'm gonna build a dashboard that explains that does local explanations for the predictions of the model I've trained in step two in Streamlet. So as a like as a sample, um, you could so the first thing we're gonna build looks it's gonna look like this. You're gonna have you know, buttons, it's show me penguins, and then um, there's gonna be some graphs, plots, and yeah, th th we're gonna see how to how we could integrate Streamlet with Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Plotly if you're so. And it also integrates with other plotting libraries. But in this talk, we're going to talk, we're going to look at those three. And afterwards, we're going to do a, we're going to have a dashboard. We're going to create a dashboard that does explanations of predictions. In this case, predicting the penguin species, these cute little penguins. We're going to make a model to predict them based on um, um, features of the penguin, and um, we're going to have explanations about them. So let's jump into it. So um it's most of the, all the material for this is going to be in the link i'm going to we're going to provide it i'm going to provide it in the chat and we're going and and we're going to private in the description of the video i'm hoping so the first thing you do to start this up is that i'm going to start from from scratch there's going to be nothing in my editor and i'm going to have a terminal window that's that's also here. All I have in this folder is um, images of the penguins. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the, um, I'm going to follow them as an instruction. While starting any Python project, I'm going to, I'm going to create an environment. I've already set one up. Huh? Stop. OK, cool. So I want to build that pe the, the penguins thing that we had before. And I'll show you how to do it from the beginning. I'm going to have some imports. OK, cool. That's good. I'm going to have some imports. And then like every time I save, um, Streamlit will, would, would, sa would, save, would, would update by itself. So in this case, if I have a title that is something that is sh sh show me the penguins, Uh, what the... I see. All right, so to run, okay, so the first thing is, all right, let me start from the beginning. The first thing is to run Streamlit. You need to install the install the libraries that I had in my repo, and then you run this command called Streamlit run, and I'm going to put an extra command that says run on save, which tells Streamlit to rerun the application, reload every time I save. So I'm gonna s go quickly through this because we had some technical issues, but um, we could we'll make it together, All right? So in this case, I wanna show me the penguins. So when, when I saved it, it was sh it um, updates the the title. If I if I don't say some and I save, you see that it auto updates as well. So this is very interactive, and um, I find this very powerful because now I could um, interactively create. Um, interactions such as like let's say I want to create a dialog box a radio box I, I input this I put this in the code and then I could when I save it 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 auto updates the dashboard in the web in the application so 
So in this case, it allows me to select the penguin. So this is st.radial. And um, if I print out the sp species, you see that this radio, when, when I set the radio through the UI, it auto updates the species in the program itself. So in this case, I am outputting the species. So in this case, um, I have images of the species. So I could showcase the images like this using Python's um, F strings. And so if when I click on this thing, it auto updates to these cute little penguins. And um, so it's very cool. So I'm writing pure Python and it auto updates the dashboard without um, without me writing any JavaScript or any, yeah. So I, I could say in pure Python. Um, so here I'm, I'm gonna create a dictionary and I wanna link it. I wanna link my species to um, to the Wikipedia page and I could write pure markdown. So I could write some markdown and I could use F strings and then it'll give me this um, this header This header that that links to different that links to different penguins in so if I if I click if I click on Geto and I click on Wikipedia page it will link to the Wikipedia page for the penguin so that's pretty cool now if I try to do EDA I have a data set in this folder that loads the data set that loads the data I could look at the data like if I want to see the data. I could just write penguins and it would show me the pandas data frame as a rendered HTML. So which is so you could see the different features, you can see the species, you can see how big their beef their beak is or the or their flipper length is, and so forth. So you can look at the data. So if we have any questions we want to ask about the data set, we could we could okay, let's say you have a question about the data set. Let's say how many how many species are there in our data set? Um, so you see that I, I I put the question in the as a header and then it shows me in the dashboard. Now, so get, one way to answer this is to use uh, use pandas. So you could do the you could say the value counts. So I could have a penguin's value count here. And then so this will give me the value count for each species. So, so it, it will show me the pandas um, the data frame. But and I, if I, if I want to plot if I want to plot this, I could use the pandas API to plot like so. So this will this this will help me plot. Um, but there's no axis, so I'm going to create an axis because so this is for those who are familiar with the matplotlib API. This will help plot and then for streamlit I have to create, I use um, the matplotlib API to create a figure. I pass the access to the plotting API in pandas. And this will quickly, so in three lines of code, I could create a bar plot um, showing how many species are there per data set. Now, uh, if I want to answer questions like, uh, What's the flipper length? Could the flipper length be used to distinguish between the species? And in the aspect, just so we could get to the next, in the, we could we could use, uh, we, could, we could use, in this case, Seaborn. And Seaborn uses the Matplotlib API. So in this case, I could, Use this, um, which is this is a new function called distrib this plot, which plots distributions, and I could um, give it. It's it, it's very you. I could give it different features in the data set, and it will help plot it. I could give the hue in this case species. In this case, you could see that there's difference. Uh, that um, the flipper length could distinguish between the blue species and then the green one. So, so this is um, example of using streamlet, but with um, the Streamlit API, uh, with the Streamlit API with Matplotlib. For those who like uh, Plotly, for those who like Plotly, we, we could have something, we could answer another question, is the cumin, which is the 
the length of the, the beak. Could that be used to classify species? We could do a scatter plot and plotly, um, where in this case I pass I could pass x and x and y as the lengths. Um, okay, so if if you if I comment these out, you see that it auto updates so that the marginals disappear. And if I if I add these marginals back in, you can see that it auto updates and adds the marginal back into my dashboard. So this is this allows us to very quickly iterate on our visualizations, such that. Um, yeah, so it, it, it allows you very quickly iterate on iteration uh, on our image, our visualizations. Um, another way, another question you could ask is how is the body mass for each species distributed? You could use a box plot, and um, same thing for those familiar with the Plotly API. This would uh, help. In this case, it will, it pl I'm plotting the species on the x-axis, and then the body mass on the y-axis, and then the colors are the gender. Um, you, you can see that if I um, I, yeah, so I, I could remove the gen the gender piece and it will, it will plot a box plot with the with the genders combined. Um, and, and if I want to separate by the, gen the gender, we could separate by just having the color be gender. So this is very, um, so this talk is about um, Streamlit. So if you're familiar with the Plotly API, you could do this with the um, box in Plotly. So, so this first example showcases how you could use extremely could interact with your the plotting libraries that you're used to. In this case, if you're using plot, uh, Matplotlib, Seaborn, or Plotly, you could use Streamlit to showcase your images without and while you stay in Python. So you see that this is I'm I'm just writing Python code and it's outputting me a dashboard interactively, which is very powerful. So this is. Um, the, the big thing about this is that you see that every time I create a figure, um, for me to output it, to output the figure in the dashboard, I have to, uh, I, I'm just, I'm, place, I'm placing the item on its own line. So in this case, scatter created an object called scat, and then I'm, to, for it to be outputted into the dashboard, I write scat by itself in this case. So that would, so Streamlib would know to, um, vendor this object in the dashboard. So that that is, that is the the basic. It's a fairly ba a fairly basic way to use Streamlit just for data visualizations. Um, me personally, I like having questions before a visualization because the the question the visualization should answer a question. So having its question driven visualizations in my mind. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I want to look at um, the data science piece. So the first part of data science is to visualize, your, to do some exploratory data analysis. And this is something, we've done this on the Penguin data set. Um, the goal of the, the model I'm going to create in a Jupyter Notebook would be to use the features that we looked at to predict the species of the penguin. So I'm going to create a very quick model using scikit-learn. And um, I'm going to showcase how to create a dashboard around this model. So um, this is uh, so I'm, I'm, so I'm a data scientist. I'm in my Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I, I launched my Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to load the I'm going to load the data, the same penguin data set we had before. Um, I'm going to have my x values, which is my features, and my y, which is my labels. In this case, the labels are the penguin species. Um, I know uh, I'm going to create a pipeline, a scikit-learn pipeline, where I'm going to encode the categorical features, and I'm going to do nothing to the numerical features. I do nothing to the numerical features in this case because I know I'm going to push this into a random forest, which doesn't require your numerical features to be scaled. So it could just take in the numerical features as is. So if I create this pipeline, you see that in the Jupyter Notebook, this is a a newish feature in scikit-learn, it, it, it outputs the visualization of the pipeline. So you can see how the data flows through a scikit-learn pipeline. And this is enabled by, by setting this configuration, set config, where display equals to diagram. Um, all this material will be in the repo. So you, you can follow this um, in your, when you have time to look over the, the, the material for this talk. So in this case, it will output this visualization in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, now, um, to, we're going to train and evaluate the model. 
So in this case, we're going to do a train set split because we are good data scientists and we're going to train on a training set and evaluate on a test set. So in this case, this model is pretty good. Um, it's, it has 98% accuracy. Uh, if accuracy is a good metric, in this case, for, um, for the time being, accuracy, accuracy is OK in our, our case. And uh, we're going to serialize the model. So this is going to create um, a serialized version of the model we just trained. Now, so I don't want to, this talk doesn't revolve around scikit-learn, so let's jump back into Streamlit. <laughs> um, so we create, so we use Juba Notebook. Now we have to build the, the machine learning model. Now we want to, as a, we want to build this thing. Like this, like this thing looks super, like very complicated. There's two libraries, there's two separate libraries in here. There's a SHAP value. There's a SHAP, I use the SHAP library to calculate the SHAP values. And I use the anchors library to calculate the anchors. Um, the SHAP values is a, um, a game theory concept where when you have many players um, trying to accomplish a task, you want to see how much credit you allocate to each player. In this case, the players are the features, and the, the task is to make is the prediction. So how much does each feature contribute to each prediction? And that's SHAP values in a nutshell. <laughs> um, we're, we're gonna and anchors is we're, we're just we're talking about anchors when we get to the dashboard for and when we develop the dashboard. Um, the surprising thing about this dashboard is that it this 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 whole dashboard takes around a hundred ish lines of code. So like it's so because Streamlit allows like Streamlit allows us to create these very interactive dashboards with very few lines of code, and you get to stay in Python. So I'm gonna start this from scratch as well. <laughs> Um, let's, let's try it. All right. So that was my intro. So my intro was this thing. It's very quick. Um, let's try another one. So in this case, I'm going to stop that server. In this case, I'm going to run Streamlit on the explain. So in this case, it'll, it'll run, it'll open a new thing. And, it, and of course it's empty because there's nothing in my file. So let's start this off. So in this case, I'm going to have imports. <laughs> We're going to use a bunch of these things. <clears throat> and um, just like before, um, I'm going to have some categories. I'm, I'm going to have the features. Just So this is a similar in the Jupyter Notebook. And I'm going to have my, my data, my penguin data. So just to see some output, if I output x, you see that the, the penguin data set is here. If I, if I output y, it's it's the species names, so it's it's all here. Um, so um, for this specific um, dashboard, I'm gonna need some. I, I want the user to spe as as you can see before. I want to I want the user to specify the island, and the gender, and um, and I want the user to specify some pieces about. Um, the I want the user to give me an instance, and I want my dashboard to explain um, why my model made this prediction. Uh, so th remember, this is ex this is explaining the machine learning model. So I I'm going to go through how to build this in Streamlit. So in the future, I'm going to need some of these these metadata metadata about my uh, my data set. Um, in this case, is very. These are very simple. Um, the metadata is just um, the the categories for the island category, and then the gen the categories for the gender. And also, I wanted I want the min max of each of my numerical features, which I'm going to use later when I set up um, this 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 um this interactive selector. Because I, I don't want I don't want the user to input um, a number that is outside the bounds of um, what what outside the bounds of I want I don't want the user to put things outside the bounds of the the data set. So so I, I've saved the minimum max and values for the miracle features. So to create the radio the radio item the radio the thing on the radio selector. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to do one first. So sidebar that radio. Uh, I I don't want to create. Let me let's let's not do the sidebar yet. Let's do the radio, and here I want to do select, and let's say I want to select. 
All right, so I want to select, let's say, the cumin length. Uh, or I, actually, let's do the island, the island first. Select island. So if I do this, I could, I ha since I have the metadata, I could s do something like this. And this will create this select item thing. But as you can see from here, I put this in the sidebar. So if I wanted it to be in the sidebar, I could do, instead of sc.radio, I do sc.bar, sidebar. And this will place it on a sidebar. So, so all, all the interactions you could place on a sidebar by, by prefacing the call by, um, with the word sidebar. So in this, and um, this, this is normal Python. And if I want to do many of these, let's say I have two of them in this case, I could use normal Python to write a loop. And um, in this case, I want to store the user input into a list. So I could, I'm writing normal Python on the left, and it's outputting JavaScript, um, interactive JavaScript on the right. So in this case, at this point, if I output the user input, I could see that, and I move the metadata, I could see that if I change this to mail, you could see that the user input changed to mail. If I change this island to this island, the user input changes. So the Python is um, updating every time I um, interact with the UI, which is pretty neat. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly look at also look at the uh, numerical features. In this case, the numeric features I have a number input, and I'm gonna. I, I want these step boxes to give me uh, to go up and down. The, in this case, so in this case, I'm using a sidebar numerical input, and which allows me to have numerical boxes for the for the user to put in their numerical values. And in this case, um, so then you see how the input changes as, as I update these values. You see that now it's two hundred two um, two hundred two, while this is two hundred two two hundred two. And I'm going to place this in a data frame. So if I output the data frame, it also it also outputs the data frame. And I could change this. And you see how I changed it to female, and this changed to female. OK, so this is loading in the data from the user. Now, remember, we have a, um, a model that we trained. It's called penguin underscore cot.joblib. So this is the model. We could use this to make a prediction. Um, in the interest of time, I will. Um, showcase um, pieces of this. Um, in this case, um, scikit-learn, you call predict to get the prediction of your classifier. Um, and, I, and I also want which class is predicted. So this, this code will help me grab what class this my model predicted for this specific instance. In this case, it predicted this species. I could also get the probability by calling predict prob. Oh, I already did that. And then th at the end over here, you can see that I have the probabilities of each species um, for my classifier. In this case, you see that chick tra chin trap um, has the highest probability. So that's the prediction made by the <coughs> um, made by the the model. So m remember, if you go back, you see that I have all the sh the shap value stuff here. Let's quickly look at that as well. In this case, I want to create I want to I want to create some UI, some headings for what is what is I make what explanation I'm explaining. I have the shap values, and since um the the library doesn't interact well with pipelines, um there's we have to encode our data in um using a piece of my of the pipeline. So this is scikit-learn esque, but it's still Python, and <coughs> And the way, uh, so I'm in this case, I'm in this case, I'm importing the Shap library with Tree Explainer, and if I, uh, okay, so this is fairly involved, and I I don't have too much time, so I'm gonna tr try to get through this. <laughs> um, in this case, I know I call force plot, which expects the expected value, the Shap values, um, using encoded, um, which is the encoding of the this data. By the pipeline, and um, the thing about this is that this library was built in such a way that it wants the JavaScript to be loaded first. So, 
one way to do this is to grab the JavaScript first and then directly place it into the HTML. So like this is like because Streamlit doesn't understand this library directly. Like um, there's there's ways to get around this by um, inputting the JavaScript yourself, which allows us to write Python. Like so, what this took, what this took to embed this sh um, shad values into the JavaScript into the dashboard was 20-ish lines of 15 lines of Python, which is I, I still find very cool. <laughs> so yeah, so let's get to the anchors. Um, anchors is even semi simpler. Um, anchors also doesn't ex um, anchors is built in such a way that it expects NumPy arrays. So in this case, um, I'm gonna create this anchor explain object, and um, they have this interface where you want to explain an instance. And and if I want the HTML version of this, I call as HTML, and then it will output this this anchor explanation. Um, the cool thing about the anchor explanation <coughs> is is that a cool thing about the anchor explanation is that um, it it could it it, 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 it explains your instance in a very specific way using anchors, where an anchor explanation is a rule that sufficiently anchors the prediction locally, such that the changes to the rest of the feature values of the instance do not matter. So in this case, in this case, you can see that for this instance, um, this is the anchor. So it's trying to say that if these conditions hold, the AI would, the, in this case, the model would predict this species 97% of the time. So, um, if you had, if we had domain knowledge about penguin species, <laughs> um, you, you could say that, um, is, is this counterintuitive? Does, does this make sense? <laughs> and, um, we could, we could, um, debug the model this way, um, because this is what the model is trying to tell you about, um, how it, ex it got to this prediction, this chin, chin shot prediction. If I tried another model, let's say, if I try another um, um, data um, data point, let's say I try using this island, and I use mail, and um, if I set this to 49, and then this to 16, you see how every time I'm changing the the body, um, the data points, the, the application updates automatically. In this case, you can see that the shape values uh, in for the first two species, Chinstrap and Ad Adelai, go to zero, while the, the last species, can Gentle, go to one. <laughs> and um, so in this case, the Shap values is telling us that um, the feature, the, these are the features, so these are the features, and these features push, um, how much each feature pushes the probability to zero. And in this case, how much these features push the probability to one. And the anchor explanation is telling us that if the def, the cubeman def is lower than 17.3 and the body mass is greater than this, then at 99.6% of the time, it predicts the species. So, um, that's not, so this is a gist of anchors. Um, it tries to give um, an explanation with some, f with, it tries to give an, exp an anchor explanation about your specific instance, and if and it allows you to debug your model, and it gives you a view into the machine learning model. Um, okay, so that's anchors. So you see that like the, the code written here was all in Python, and it allows me to create this dashboard to have, which I could ship to. Um, someone I could ship so that anyone could use this to explain the predictions. So like penguins is a very low stakes prediction, but if this was um, a medical prediction, like if this was um, if you have cancer or not cancer, a doctor with domain knowledge about cancer could look at these anchors or look at these features to see if this model is making sense or the, if this model makes sense in his domain or his or her domain. And so this. It's very useful in that aspect. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, Streamlit, um, there's a, a bit I didn't get into. 
today about Streamlit. There's um, performance aspects. Um, there's okay, so the, the Streamlit website. And there's a performance. There's a performance aspect where we have caching and laying out, which I didn't explain. Where you could lay out your dashboard how how you want, and caching increases performance of your um, your dashboard. There's also Streamlit sharing, which you could sign up for, which allows you to create the Streamlit um, applications, and they will help host the app the application for you, the Streamlit application for you, and you could share these with your with others um so all the, the links to the slides and everything and how to reproduce everything i've mentioned in this talk is in this repo um yeah and um, yeah so and the slides which i have also resources on the shape values and the anchors in the slides so this is the streamlet it's very cool it's it allows a I've loved staying in Python and then creating dashboards and not having to write too much JavaScript. And it's very powerful in that matter. And thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I have to say that I, when I used to see these dashboards in R, I was very, very envious. And I'm so happy that there's a way to make them in um, Python. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to post them on um, on the Q and A. Thomas is here with us for the next ten or so minutes, so it's a great um, opportunity to ask him any questions. So I do have a question for you, Thomas. How did you get started using it? Yep. Um, it, it, I think it, 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 it appeared on my radar. I, I hear myself. <laughs> this is bad. Um, okay. It's weird. I could hear you just fine. And maybe it's my mic. Sometimes when there's two mics going, I don't know. Uh, do you, uh, you know, I'll go on mute. Do you want to check the Q and A and just uh, if if it's a if you can see the tab and just answer the questions there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Okay, I could read the question too. All right, all right. Um, so I I I I, I use Streamlit. Bec it got on my radar because I'm I'm always looking at different visualization tools. Um, and this. They just got seed funding, and they, it seems very exciting. Um, when uh, this 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 goes into the next question in the Q and A, like what are the key differences between Streamlit and Dash? Dash. Um, so I, I was using Dash for a while to create um, dashboards, just <laughs> and um, <clears throat> Dash. You have to ve very carefully. You have to specify the HTML. Um, and the, the, you have to connect the pieces together manually, and which takes time. Well, my end goal is to create the dashboard without thinking too much about the layout, and or like, and um, connecting pieces together. In this case, um, you see how when I connect the pieces together, they auto they automatically connect. Um, so when I store this input into Python variables, and I put the Python variables as input into other objects, it just automatically updates. So like when I click female here, it automatically connects this um, component with components um, with an anchor with a chef, chef value component and an anchors component. So it's very um, flexible in this way. Um, what are other alternatives to Streamlit? Um, there's a few. There's there's um, Dash, which is heavily used. There's also Vala, where it converts a Jupyter notebook to a dashboard. Um, the, the, those are the two that I hear about the most. Uh, when, when it comes to writing Python first, 
and then converting it to a dashboard <laughs> in that space. Um, the next question is, is there a time limit for the external API? Does this stand up for as long as I keep the server running? Um, as you keep this, as long as this, this, this is running, it will, it will be okay. And as long as your machine can run it. <laughs> so, so as long as you keep the server running, it runs. So in this case, remember this, this needs a server component to serve the material because there is Python running in the background. So when you update these inputs, Python is running on a server somewhere. And in this case, my local machine <laughs> and, um, it ha and it updates the UI reactively. Um, next question is, there is a progress bar in the streamlet, but I was thinking if there was an async way, a way with async IO. Um, I don't think um, streamlet currently interacts with Python async IO um, currently. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm look at chat. What are the um, next question is what challenges or missing features have you found from Streamlet? The biggest mixing feature has recently been added, which um, is the layout, which it's a beta feature. So that's, that's so I didn't include it in this talk because it could change, but it was, it was, um, for a while, it was extremely hacky to get like two columns in Streamlit, but now they made it easier with, um, um, something called beta columns because it's a, it's a beta feature, which allows you to, um, so if you see here, it allows you to write Python. Like in this, in this case, I want three columns and it uses Python's context manager in such a way where you could specify, in this case, three images to be side by side in three columns. So this, I, I felt that this was the biggest feature missing for a long time, but they recently added this feature. And so I'm happy. Well, <laughs> um, so it, yeah. I, I can't think of any more features for myself that I will want from Streamlit after they ha added the um, layout. <laughs> Another question is, what is the easiest, best way to deploy a Streamlit app to make it accessible on the web? Um, there are two ways. Um, the one way I, I've, I didn't show directly in my presentation, but in the repo is that you could deploy using Heroku and Heroku deployment is pretty simple. You just need a proc file and a runtime file um, that specifies the Python version and the proc file to specify how to run it. And okay, of course, and a requirements file to specify what other requirements to run it. Um, that's one way to run it. The other way to run it and Streamlit is providing the service for now, um, um, it's providing a service to share your streamlink application. So there's, um, uh, if you look at my, the slides, there's a sharing, streamlink sharing. You can sign up a streamlink sharing and it allows, it allows you to share your application with others and they'll host a service for you for now, um, for free. Okay. I visit the external IP, I, external IP port, but I don't see the dashboard. Is it possible to share the dashboard as I'm developing it? Oh, I haven't used that workflow before where you, you could, I think it's possible, but you, you would have to vim into the server <laughs> and then edit the file direct, like on server. I, I could see other ways to do it, but, um, you have to have the server watching the file as you develop and I could see that working. Um, as long as you do the correct networking to make sure that you have access to the server. Uh, um, the question was, um, I, I visited the external IP port, but I don't see the dashboard. Is it possible to share the dashboard as I'm developing it? So the answer is yes, as long as you can access the server and you can sh and the other person has access to the IP. 
Um, next question is: Is it response? Is it responsive? Um, okay, let's. So if I, if I, it's as responsive as it could be for a dashboard that takes this much space. You see that how the sideboard closes. <laughs> so that so if if I was on the phone, I would see this, which is okay. But you see that the dashboard takes up a lot of space in, in itself. The visualization takes up a lot of space, but it is responsive and. It, as I, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, um, I think it's, I think that's all the questions. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so much. And thank you so much for your patience with our technical difficulties as well. I'm glad, um, I'm glad the presentation, the show did go on. So thank you. Right. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>